Good evening, my name is Kenny Young, and I'm this year's chair of the VIP Distinguished Speaker Series. The VIP Distinguished Speaker Series is one of the many programs put on by the Undergraduate Business Council for the Red McComb School of Business. Today we are joined by Dean David Platt, Associate Dean for Undergraduate Programs at the McComb School of Business, and Sharon Turney, recent CEO and President of Victoria's Secret. We'll begin today by allowing our speaker, Ms. Turney, to open up with a brief message about leadership and giving back, and then we'll proceed with the interview portion between Dean Platt and Ms. Turney, followed by an open Q&A from the audience. As a reminder, today's event will end promptly at 6.30 p.m., and we greatly appreciate if you could refrain from leaving early and using your electronic devices. Sharon Jester Turney is a retail executive with more than 30 years of experience launching e-commerce businesses and growing world-class brands. Turney recently served as president and chief executive officer of the $7 billion Victoria's Secrets lingerie brand. She currently serves as an advisor to Victoria's Secrets parent company, L Brands. Turney joined the company as president and chief executive officer of Victoria's Secrets Direct, the brand's catalog and e-commerce arm in May 2000. And in 2006, she became president and CEO of Victoria's Secrets brand, which consists of Victoria's Secrets stores, Victoria's Secrets Direct, Victoria's Secrets Pink, and Victoria's Secrets Beauty. Before Victoria's Secret, uh, Ms. Turney worked for Neiman Marcus, where her roles included executive vice president for merchandising, creative production, advertising, public relations, and senior vice president and general merchandise manager for Neiman Marcus stores. She received her Bachelor of Arts in Business Education from the University of Oklahoma. An active member in her community, <laughs> we still love her. Uh, Turney recently serves as uh, chairman of the board of directors for the Research Institute uh, at Nationwide Children's Hospital, is a member of the board of directors for MI Homes, and serves on the J.H. Baker Retailing Initiative Advisory Board at the University of Pennsylvania's Wharton School of Business. She is involved with the Family Violence Coalition at Nationwide Children's Hospital, and the Jean B. McCoy Community Center for the Arts. So without further ado, please help me welcome Ms. Turney as she shares her views, insights, and perspectives on leadership and giving back. Well, good evening, and it is such a pleasure to be here. You know, University of Texas is one that I have admired for many years in terms of your bold ambitions, the things that you do for the communities, the, all the great students that are here, and all the great graduates that come out of this great school. I want to thank you for not booing when they said that I went to the University of Oklahoma. Uh, and uh, we are great rivals. And it was interesting, we were talking a little bit earlier. And uh, by the way, I have lived in Texas longer than I have lived in Oklahoma. Just wanted you to know that. Um, and we were talking earlier is that when those two schools meet, when Oklahoma and Texas play at the Red River, you never know what school's going to win. It's interesting. They plan. They get pumped up. I don't care if Texas has the best, you know, team and maybe Oklahoma's not, then that's the year Oklahoma wins. Or Oklahoma has the best team and Texas maybe is secondary, that's the year Texas wins. It's amazing how those two schools get pumped up to, to really win, win and beat each other. But anyway, I'm not here to talk about um, football. I'm here to talk about with you today leadership. I want to talk to you about passion. And then I want to talk about philanthropy and how philanthropy is important to all of us. And it's amazing that there are, you know, over 50,000 students that go to the University of Texas. And I think there's 3,000 faculty. Do you realize that's like three times as big as my hometown that I grew up in in Ardmore, Oklahoma? So, wow, that's the eyes of Texas are clearly uh, looking at you. So, congratulations. When I think about leadership, do you know leadership is one of the most Googled words? Do you know that there's over 50,000 books a year written on uh, leadership? 50,000, I had to like look at that, you know, double take to that. And when you think about, well, why are 50,000 leadership uh, books written a, le a year? And I think it's that people really want to know how to be good leaders. People really want to understand what it means to be a leader. Each and every one of you today are leading something. Somebody led this event tonight. Somebody leads different meetings that you have or classes that you have. So all of us, in a way, are leaders in terms of what we do. And it's really hard to define what leadership really means. You know, and when you think about what leadership is, it's kind of like the wind. You can't see it, but you can feel it. 
And more importantly, I think that although I haven't read all 50,000 books, I've read some of them, but I have had 30 years of experience in terms of leadership, and I just wanted to share a little bit of, of how I think about leadership. The first thing in leadership is, is that you have to know your stuff. You have to understand, if I'm leading Victoria's Secret as a business, do I know my stuff? Do I understand the financials? Do I understand the product development? Do I understand buying and selling? Do I know my stuff? And you have to be an expert of what you do. And the other thing is, you have to be curious to know how your stuff is changing. Then the other last question I continue to ask myself all the time, every year, is what have I done to change something? So as a great leader, you have to know your stuff. The second thing about a leader for me is you have to care about people. And I'm really, and I'm, mean really care. And you have to also show that you care about people. You have to know how to play on a bigger team. You have to grow and nurture the talent of others. You have to make sure people know why that you care. You have to create personal connections. And you have to invest in others' growth and development, sometimes instead of yourself. And you have to take care of people. And that's a tall order. And so what do I mean when you have to take care of people? And I'm going to give you one kind of an example, and I'm sure that you can think of some here on the university, at the University of Texas. Sandy, when the Sandy Hurricane came in to New York, people remember Sandy Hurricane that came in. Obviously, we have a lot of stores in New York. We have an office in New York. A lot of people live. So when it came in, there was a lot of people who lost their homes. Before the day's end or the next morning, we had con contacted every single associate to say, are you OK? Do you have a place to live? We have an associate for associate fund that we give to, I give to, we raise money, that any time that associate gets into trouble, they can actually take money to help them, to, to take money to help them and their family. And so this is just one small example of really truly showing that you care about people. Um, and as leaders, leaders also are whole people. They listen to learn. And what do you mean by a whole person? Well, first of all, they have to know themselves. They have to be able to have a very strong moral compass. You got to get up and get a balcony view of things so that you can stay balanced. Yes, you'll want to make money, and at the same time, which is performance, how are the behaviors that are driving you to that performance? So when you think about it, if you're really saying that you're results oriented, you can get there by whipping a lash and telling people to go, go, go. You can lead from the front, the middle, or from behind. But what is the most motivating thing to people? And you know what, I'll tell you this. Most people are motivated by, you know, are different. Sometimes, you know, my motivation is like, you know, uh, a little scratch behind the ear can go a long way. I mean, you scratch behind the ear, like, you know, when you have a dog and he wants to be rubbed and you're scratching behind the ear. So it's a little bit of a compliment, can go a long way. And so I think that you have to be able to really think about balancing performance and behavior. And that's a really skill set that you have to think about. Leaders also lead themselves. They have to be an objective judge of yourself or performance and behavior. And you have to be able to coach yourself. Don't you find today here at the University of Texas and all the classes that you take that you have to be able to coach yourself? You have to plan your schedules. You have, you've got test three next week. Are you going to wait and cram for all three? That's coaching yourself. That skill, as you get older and get into a full-fledged career, will continue to be very, very important. And finally, leaders are constant learners. Curiosity has to be just a state of mind. It's always learning. Leadership is built on a foundation of curiosity, adaptation, and optimism. So now, why do I talk about having adaptability? Why is adaptability an important characteristic? And I read recently, and I can't believe this is true, but I did read it, that if you go to college today, 
By the time you graduate, about half of what you learned your first semester will be obsolete. How many believe that? One, two, three, few. Okay. What if I told you that I'm in the business of obsoleting? I'm in the business of that. I'm in the fashion business. And do you know what being in the fashion business is? is to make sure that you obsolete whatever you had in your closet last year because I want you to buy this year. So I am in the obsolation business. So that's how fast things are going. And so that adaptability to be able to adapt is very, very important. So in a world that is changing so fast, knowing your stuff is hard, what you learned as foundational or conventional wisdom might become irrelevant might become irrelevant in a year, five years, or 10 years, but I promise you, it will become irrelevant. You know, we always um, use this analogy that, you know, back in the day before Ford built his first car, we got it through horse and buggy. And so if you wanted a faster transportation, well, what are you gonna do? Just get a faster horse. But guess what? The horse got antiquated by what? The car. I mean, everything gets obsoleted, and it's, 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 it's very true. So remaining relevant means being curious and constantly learning, evolving, and being adaptable. So if you see yourself as a leader or want to be a leader, no matter what field, then you have to think about the subject of leadership and how to develop yourself as a leader. You have to take the subject seriously. Truman once said that not all readers were leaders, but all leaders were readers. Be curious about yourself, patterns, understanding, and changes. You're in charge of your leadership. Seek out opportunities to lead. That's how you learn. And do it with passion. And passion is one of my favorite words. And I truly, truly know that all of you are being faced today with, okay, I'm coming to school, I'm gonna study what? You have to declare a major. And so then you're gonna decide, you declared a major, now what are you gonna do when you graduate? And sometimes people think about it from a status perspective or some people think about it from a money perspective. And I will tell you that passion has to be the main ingredient. If you are passionate about what you want to do and what you study and what you end up doing, all of those other things, wealth creation, status, all of those things will come. If you're not, you won't. You'll get bored, you'll get unintentive, you don't wanna try as hard, it's harder to refresh yourself. So, you know, when I think about passion, it's contagious and it's inspirational all at the same time. And so I always tell people to follow their passion because I truly believe that passion leads to success. And to be a great leader, you have to be passionate about what you do. Which kind of leads me to my last point tonight is on philanthropy. And we have a saying in the business, when we do well, when we succeed, then we must also do good. And you know what? I started looking up the word philanthropy, uh, I don't know, a long time ago. And there's a lot of definitions. But of all the definitions, the one that I like most is this. Philanthropy is the love of humanity in the sense of caring, nourishing, developing, and enhancing what it means to be human. It's important and noble to want to make things better for others. And there are a million ways to do that. So I don't stand here ready to impart absolute truths about what to do and not to do when it comes to our own personal philanthropy. My story is one of a poor small town girl who grew up on a farm and over time was fortunate to learn the craft of philanthropy. It's a craft I've been practicing for a dozen years. Like any craft, our philanthropic work takes hours, days, weeks, years of practice and refining. It matures over time as we learn, have new experiences, and our perspectives grow. It starts with learning, with gaining the basic understanding of the value of giving, 
our time, talent, and treasure. Then we have to hone our craft, and then you have to pass that craft on. You have to pass that on, hopefully, to your children, to your neighbors, and to your friends. The process of learning through growth and improvement is the very essence of what craft is about, and it must be nurtured just like leadership. Philanthropy has distinguishing features from charity. Charity aims to relieve the pain of a particular social problem, whereas philanthropy attempts to address the root cause of the problem. The difference between the old proverbial saying, don't just give someone a fish, teach them how to fish. So I've worked at Victoria's Secret for 16 years, and the purpose of the Victoria's Secret as a company is to make money. As a business, we have a responsibility to our associates, to our customers, and to our shareholders to be successful. But it's not enough as a company to simply be bottom line driven. An attorney and writer, Albert Pike, once said, what we have done for ourselves alone dies with us. What we have done for others and the world remains and is immortal. I'm going to say that again. It's so powerful. What we have done for ourselves alone dies with us. What we have done for others and the world remains and is immortal. So at Victoria's Secret, we started to think about what is our higher purpose. And as I said, we believe that we are doing well. We should also be doing good. So our purpose that we said is to improve lives, whether it makes someone happy with a purchase or giving back to the community that we live in, as well as the communities that we do business in. And a big area for us is a focus on women. Victoria's Secret, we like to say, is a company for women run by women. And we believe very much in the positive power of women. We know that women feel good, feel confident and powerful, and when they feel that way, they will do amazing things. The happiness and contentment projects onto those around them, their children, their partners, their friends, and their family. And I know in Texas, well, I know in Dallas they have this saying, and I bet they do in Texas uh, down here in Austin too, if mama ain't happy, nobody's happy. Well, thankfully, that works in reverse, too. If mama's happy, everyone's happy. So for us at Victoria's Secret, our purpose starts with our passion, a passion for making women feel confident and empowered. At Victoria's Secret, there are many examples of how we improve lives. We empower people in our communities with the tools they need to succeed. One great example about what we've done at Victoria's Secret is that we partnered with a vendor as we were thinking about opening a factory in Vizag, India. And we had to go out to villages and to recruit workers. And at this time, out in these country, out in these country homes, they were literally grass huts. And so we recruited mostly females because males really didn't work. And most of these women, and some of them were married and some of them were daughters, had never worked outside the home. They didn't have the sewing skills that they needed. They had never sewn before. And in fact, they weren't as educated. And in some areas, they needed education in very, very basic ways, like hygiene. They used to learn how to squat. They didn't know how to sit in a chair. The fathers and husbands had to agree to allow them to work. And it was a very, very male-dominated culture. We brought them in. We established training. We provided child care. We provided transportation. And so everything was great. We open, opened up the factory, and it was wonderful. We gave our first paychecks out. We talked about the women when they came back. And we noticed that some of them were kind of upset. And we said, what's going on? And they said, well, when I got home, my father took my paycheck. Or my husband took my paycheck. So we said, ha, huh, let's open up a credit union. So you put half your money in, then you take half your money home. So if they take it from you, you still have your own money. We provided scholarships for their children to go to school. And one of the most important things for a child to go to school was that they needed a uniform. That was really basically it. So we made uniforms for them to be able to go to school. So it was truly a win-win for everyone. 
It allowed us to produce high quality product quickly, open more stores, and as a result, employ more people in the US. To build stores, you have to have contractors. To open your stores, you have to have people, that you have to have management and you have to have sales. To run the back of the house, you have to have operations. So it was truly a win-win for all of us in terms of helping so many. And there's so many other examples. Another one is that um, literacy is really the foundation for a successful life in a thriving society. And it is so important in terms of where literacy is. And so we set up a program where we allowed our sales associates and ourselves, anyone, friends, to actually go in and spend a day a week helping people, helping young folks in grade school read. And it was quite rewarding because, as you know, two thirds of the students who cannot read by the end of the fourth grade will end up in jail or on welfare. So, as I wrap up, I think being philanthropic, whether it's your time, talent, or treasure, is an incredible gift. It's our opportunity to shape the world, to empower people to help themselves and others, and a little goes a long way. It takes a surprisingly small amount of energy to make a surprising, significant impact. Just do a little bit of good right where you are and watch what takes shape around you. Follow your passion, learn to be a leader, and I'm sure we'll talk more about this as we go through this evening. And I am going to now have a great conversation with Dean Pratt. So thank you. All right. Thank you, Ms. Turney, for that wonderful insight. Uh, for the next 20, 20 minutes, we'll move on to our interview segment. So take it away, Dean Pratt. Thank you for being here, Sharon. We really I am appreciate so it. so excited great. to be here. So speak, going back to your point about passion, Everybody here, or at least all the students here, are facing decisions about where they're going to work. And they're trying to balance what you talked about with passion versus money, perhaps, versus where they want to be, um, where their parents think they should be. There's an awful lot to balance there. So could you tell us a little bit about how you got started, how you chose your first job, whether it fet your, fet met your criterion for passion, and how it proceeded from there? Sure. You know, pe many people always ask me the question, did you know you wanted to be a CEO? And I'm like, never even thought it was pop never even thought about it. Mm -hmm. Didn't even think I knew what that terminology meant. Uh, I was going to be a teacher. My mom was a teacher. I was going to be a teacher. I, we all know I went to the University of Oklahoma. Um, so I went to that school up north. And so when I went to school, I was going to major in business education. I was going to teach business to the secondary uh, education, which is the high schoolers. And when I, um, I got to take a lot of great business classes, but then when it all came down to it, I went to career day and I signed up for everything. I signed up for retailers. I signed up to be auditing. They said, do you want to audit? Do you know what it is? I said, no, but I'm sure I can learn it. Don't worry. I didn't get that job. But I did <laughs> get a job with the retailers. And as I started working, I found my passion. Or I don't think I would have done it for more than th almost 40 years and been able to be where I am today. And I will tell you, there's going to be many times that you may not know exactly today what it is. You're still young. You'll get out. You'll experience things. Every new experience will get you a little bit closer to what your true passion is. It will. And it takes some to people... You know, you know, my son knew what he wanted to do very, you know, early on. We'll see how long it lasts and if that's really his true passion, but right now it is. So I think it yeah. just takes time. Okay. But then passion won't carry you all the way through to being a CEO. What, no. what sets you apart and gets you to the position of CEO? Well, I think a couple of things. One is I became a student. So although I didn't really study a lot of business, I did have a business background in education. So I became a student of retail, and I became a student of what does it mean to be leadership. If I had a project, and let's say back then it was open to buy and how to figure out open to buy, I would stay up like it was a, an exam and really work through it because I really needed to understand if you're going from point A to B, I wanted to understand every single step of the way. Mm -hmm. And so the tenacity that went into that and the curiosity. And then the other thing that drives my husband and son crazy is I ask questions, tons of questions. Well, why did you think that? Well, how did you know that? Well, what did you do? And it's like, ah, oh, they run from me. But I think that's part of that curiosity. <laughs> so I see a lot of really wonderful, smart, curious, passionate female students, women in my classes. And yet we look at C-suites 
and there aren't very many yet. What do you think has to change for that to be different? You know, uh, knock on wood, I am so glad I'm in the industry I am because there's a lot of women in the C-suites. The I think that if a woman wants to be in a C-suite, she can be there. Mm -hmm. I wonder sometimes if people choose to, you know, maybe they don't want the C-suite because they want to have a better balanced life. Uh, I think there's many different reasons, but I don't believe that women can't be in C-suites. I don't believe that women can have the same as men. I've never experienced that. And trust me, guess what division I was in in my first year out, which was the men's division. I was the first woman in the women in the men's division. Now, so I was, what, 21 and these guys were a little older. Did they tie my shoes to the ceiling the first Christmas that we all worked there? Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> so you take that. But um, I really believe if you work hard and this is something that you want to do, that women can and will be more in the C-suite. I think we're seeing more and more year after year. Mm, good. Um, who do you admire the most? Oh, uh, my mother. You know, my mother was raised five kids, had a job, was a very spiritual human being. My baby brother, when he was born, had brain damage. And so, you know, back then, you know, it was something terrible to have a, a child like that. And she weathered through that. Uh, she fought cancer. So she was, she was really um, a special human being. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, I also admire Les. I've worked for Les. He's been my boss for 16 years and gave me a lot of autonomy. And he's taught me a lot. And, you know, when I think about all the people that I admire or that my mentors, I got to work for Stanley Marcus. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I worked for Bert Tansky. I worked for Terry Lundgren. A lot of these mentors, you know what they did? They cared about me. They really showed that they cared about me. They shared the wisdom with me. And that was, you know, pretty, pretty remarkable. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you've resigned your position recently I did. as CEO. I did. That almost seems impossible once you reach this amazing level to actually walk away. How did you decide to do that? Well, you know, not by the faint of heart. You know, it was interesting is that been at Victoria's Secret for 16 years. And by the way, it is the best job in the world. <laughs> I promise you it is. And, um, but after working for almost 40 years, I'm going to be 60 years old. I said, you know, I've got another good run for me in my later half. You guys are in your front of the half, I'm in my last half. And when I thought about that, I said, I really want to stop and reflect on what have I learned? What have I accomplished? What have I done? How do I bring more, you know, how do I bring the best of me even to the forefront more? What can I improve on? And then I want to go attack another assignment. And so it'll be something. I don't know yet what that might be. Uh, but I want to be very introspective. I am going with the Catholic Relief Services in uh, June to Vietnam and Cambodia on a, on a mission. Uh, we got to know a lot about them as we were working in Burkina Faso. So I'm kind of excited of what I say is my next journey. Hmm, that's good. That actually ties in really well to my next question, which is, is there something that you haven't mastered yet that you'd like to? Uh, well, there's, there's one big thing. It's called patience. <laughs> um, yeah, patience. But um, I haven't ma mastered patience yet. But I think when I think about what goes on in the world, there's, there's so much. Mm -hmm. And I don't think you can ever master it all. Yeah. I think it changes so fast. And so what I want to do is just continue to learn and to read about it. And uh, I do need to work on my patience. Yeah. How about failure? We often hear that millennials in particular don't know how to fail, that we don't give enough opportunities to fail. How do you, how do you fail successfully? Well, I will tell you this. If you're not failing, you're not learning. And I hate that word failure, right? So, you know, what, what, is, what is a failure? I, I'm not, I'm, you know, so let's forget the word. But you have to stumble. You have to, you, somebody's got to get a promotion over you. So let me just tell you a story, and you can tell me if this is failure or not. So we were all, oh, in my first training class, there was probably four of us that were now in the lead to be the head of the class, and I was one of them. So the first buying job comes open, and it's the tie buying job. And so guess what? We're all clamoring for the tie buying job because so we can say, I was the first one to make buyer. Well, I didn't get it, and I was very upset, and I'm talking to my, you know, 
boss and said, oh, I kind of really wanted that. And he looks at me and goes, you want to be a tire buyer? Why do you want to be a tire buyer? There is something bigger and better for you coming. Oh my gosh, you don't need to be the tire buyer. A month later, maybe even not a month later, I was promoted to the prestigious young men's job, which was one of the biggest jobs in men's. And so, okay, what, what was it? Was it my ego that was saying you want to be a tie buyer? Or, or what was it? Did it matter that I was the first? Is that a failure? Well, it was a great learning lesson. And I, and, and I think you have to look at these things when you're disappointed. Get up and just say, okay, that was just a learning lesson. Thank you. I got to learn. And be thankful for the learning lesson that you get, especially younger, because let me tell you, the higher up you go, the bigger you fall when you have the wrong learning lessons. <laughs> Um, so as you, you've been CEO now for 16 years yeah. at Victoria's Secret, so what, what has changed at Victoria's Secret during your time as CEO? Well, I think that the core values have not changed, uh, but I will tell you everything else has changed mm -hmm. in terms of how we communicate. Um, as if you think about it, we truly launched and kind of got fully up and running in 2000 in terms of the e-commerce site. Now, back then, you didn't have Twitter, you didn't have Facebook, social media didn't exist. We mailed 350 million catalogs a year. Our stores were kind of old, and, and not old, but you felt older when you went into them. And so how do we become a little bit younger and forever young? So we redesigned the stores. We thought about the product differently. We actually got into social media. media. We reinvented the fashion show and put the fashion show on television. Um, so how we do business in the Far East has changed. With the amount of speed, nobody wants to wait. So now we can actually place an order on a Monday and within 15 days have panties delivered to the stores. Before, it would have probably taken six months. So the entire supply chain and how we think about fabrics and how we design, all of those processes has really changed. Okay. So you mentioned supply chain as, you've, as a CEO. We have students here studying finance, studying marketing. Can you talk about some of those other areas? Oh, this is the beauty of retail. You name it, and that function exists in retailing. So when you think about the financial world, there's probably three different pieces of the financial world that are there. There's the pl planning and deployment. There's truly your uh, CFOs, mm -hmm. who are the chief financial officers who have to go in. There's truly an audit department that has to happen. <laughs> There's truly a tax department that has to happen when you're talking about this multi-organization. So when you think about all the areas of finance, there is a very broad range of opportunities within that financial community. Right. So, and what the beauty of it is, is you can think that you want to go into, you know, general, you know, finance, or you can say, okay, I'm going to do that, but I may go try uh, planning and allocation. It's still a financial buy grant. How much are you going to buy and how much are you going to sell? That's financial. So there's so many different pieces and parts. Obviously, marketing, defined in a very broad word today, is something that we do every day. How do you market to the customer? How do you read the customer data? So not only do you have the customer analytics part of marketing, you have the creative part of marketing. You have the website that you have to put up. Um, when you think from an operations perspective is how are you going to run 1,149 stores? When you think about human resources and what brings about human resources, I'll go all the way up the chain and it starts with designing. What fabrics? Designing our own fabric, designing our prints. How do we want to bring the, you know, how do you leverage that? How do you hit price points? Where do you go to source it? Where do you find trends from? All of that plays into, mm -hmm. uh, into mm -hmm. Victoria's Secret. Yeah. Um, what, what are your leadership principles as you've been the leader? Well, I, I think the, the most, you know, probably what I said earlier in terms of really you have to know your stuff. Yeah. And not that you have to know all of it. I mean, I hope all of you have read the book Team of Rivals by, you know, about Lincoln because he, he surrounded himself with things and people that maybe gave him different points of view. Mm -hmm. Or also he, um, or, or maybe that, that, he, that they were better than he was. And I think that's so important for a leader to understand what you're good at, what you're not good at, and to be able to surround, uh, surround yourself. Your values and your moral compass is truly, truly important yeah. because it is one of the most important things because you're dealing with people, people's lives, and people's careers every day. And so I think that is so important to think about uh, as well. And then you're a lifelong learner. Yeah. 
What do you think a company's, you talked earlier about philanthropy, what do you think a company's job is with respect to society and philanthropy? I think that they have a big responsibility. Mm -hmm. I think that especially in the communities that they do business in. Mm -hmm. Because in the communities that they do business in, they're taking money in, they're supporting, obviously they're giving people jobs, but, but then how are they giving back to that community of those that are not necessarily as fortunate as them. Mm -hmm. Whether it's through the reading programs, whether it's through uh, children's programs, whether it's through your cancer research, I think they have a huge responsibility mm -hmm. about giving back to the communities. Yeah, Do, doing, well by, doing, doing well by doing good. Yes. That's right. Yeah. While you're doing, yes. <laughs> Get it Close enough. Yeah. <laughs> um, what can a company's leadership do to inspire ethical standards in a company? I'm sorry, do what? What, what can a company's leadership do, do to inspire uh, the ethical standards of the employees of the company? Exactly. They are, they are, the, they are the milestone. Yeah. It's like as a leader, we always say, you know, the shadow of a leader. They are the ones that have to walk the talk. Mm -hmm. They need to lead the way. If you want people underneath you to give, you need to step up and give. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I was always kind of wanted people, if I gave money away, I, I'm like, gosh, I really don't want people to know I'm kind of giving this much money or whatever. And Les Wexner told me, yeah, you do. I said, no, no, I don't. He goes, no, yes, you do. I said, well, why? why? He goes, so young people can aspire to do that. If they don't know that you do that, how do they aspire to do that? Hmm. So I thought it was a very interesting concept. Yeah, yeah. And, and how about the, you mentioned earlier that, that Victoria's Secret is a company run by women yeah. for women. How about the advancement of women through the company? How, is, how has that been promoted by the company? A very, you know, very rapidly. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's why it's hard for me when people ask me the question, is that do women get a fair shake in the business world? And I have to tell you, it's, you know, we've been very influential. I mean, we, you, if, if there were all the store managers sitting here today, and I, we love our men, but it would be 80% women. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It would be 80% women, and they're advanced. They're, the CFO of the company is a woman. Mm -hmm. The head of marketing is a woman. The other two CEOs, in the, the two CEOs, both over Pink and Beauty uh, and Victoria's Secret, were all women. So there's a lot of women mm -hmm. and a lot of advancement. And then it's interesting because I think as we have shared what we do, when we go now to our supply chain, whether it's in Sri Lanka or India or Asia, there are more women now in top spots than you would ever have seen before. Before we open it to the audience, maybe you could just, uh, what's the best piece of advice you've ever been given that you could share with all of them? The best piece of advice I ever got was from my father. And he said, you're only as smart as the ground you grew up on. And I didn't understand that for the longest time, and I finally got it. So, you know, if you grow up in Ardmore, Oklahoma, and that's all you've been exposed to, then that's what you know. You know about cattle. You know about how to farm. You know how to milk a cow. That's what you know. Somebody else grew up in Dallas, Texas, and their dad might have been an oil man. So and they knew all about oil. Does one of those make the other one better? No. All it is, is that you can learn anything. So don't be intimidated by it. You're, only ex you're gonna get more and more exposure as you go through life. So that was so profound mm -hmm. for me. Mm -hmm. good. good, Well, let's go ahead and open it up for questions here. Um, I think we have, yeah, we have a microphone on both sides. And so if you have a question, just come on down the aisle on the side that you're closest to, and the guys here will, will help you uh, figure out how to ask your question. And ahead, don't so, be bashful, yeah, get right. on down here. <laughs> it always starts out slow and then people get turned away at the end, so come quick, and get your chance. Tell me your name too. My name is Asima. Hello. Hi. My name is Asima. Uh, thank you so much for coming here today. Uh, so I wanted to ask, I was always curious, uh, I know being a CEO of such a huge company, um, did you get involved involved much in the details of the business, like like the design of the dressing rooms or like the material of which the bags are made, like, um, or were you more busy with like more global important things? 
Well, you know, uh, once a merchant and, and buyer and designer, always one, right? So uh, I did get involved in some of that some of the time, not all of the time. And I found early on, it just, it depended, because number one, I don't care how beautiful your stores are or how well your uh, sales, or, or sales associates are, if you don't have the right product, then it doesn't matter. And so product was a big core focus for me. Eh, some people said I got too much in the detail, but <laughs> I'll, I'm gonna, I'll be introspective of that as my time is off. <laughs> Did I answer your question? Okay. Come over here. Not yet. Try, try flipping it on. There we go. No? Yeah? Okay. Hi. I'm <laughs> Melissa. Um, my question was, for the next, I guess, official CEO that follows you, what's your best advice for them? I mean, you might know who it is. I'm sure you can't tell us. But what's your best <laughs> advice for them, and what do you hope they uh, do with the company? What direction do you hope they take it in? Great. You know, it's, um, it's, a, it's a great question because I was telling the guys earlier that making the decision to leave Victoria is like, you know, really getting a divorce um, because it's very hard. I do know who's taking my spot. Les Wexner is taking my job right now. So because Victoria's Secret got so big, they're going to divide it up into Victoria's Secret and Victoria's Secret Pink, which is a good thing. It really is, because it, it got mammoth. I think the, the, the best advice is that I could give is this. You have to stay close to your customer. You have to stay close to that younger customer because they're so influential. You have to stay relevant, and you always have to take care of the people that work there. And so the business is going to evolve. It's going to become bigger. We're going to have much bigger international strategy. So the other thing is, is that as I said before, product is king, is they have to take care of the brand. And to make sure that they keep that brand relevant, that they don't tarnish the brand, and they keep it a highly emotional brand. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, hi there. Hi. hi. Thank you for coming to campus. Um, yeah, so I was gonna ask, how do you toe the line, kind of following up on the earlier question about managing with like the product and all the little things like that, because you, as CEO, have responsibility over everything, and it kind of all falls on you at the end, how do you toe the line between you know, micromanaging and keeping people accountable, and how much authority do you think you ought to have in that? Yeah, I tell you what, what the way that I approach it is there's certain, we actually put together in place a very strong operating platform. So we said on Mondays, we're gonna read the business and this is what it's gonna take. On Tuesdays, we're gonna react to that business. So on Monday, when you knew what the business was, where they were reacting to the tactics, I would move on to something else. Very specific design review days, very specific days to be, to be in stores. And I will tell you what it is. There are people who've earned the right to have complete autonomy. And you say, they'll check, check in with me. Just, you know, you'll have a touch base, check in with me. There's people that you need to hold their hand, and there's people that really struggle that probably you're going to have to end up replacing them. And so how I spent my time, first of all, taking care of the business, then then what leader or leaders or group of people needed more of my time, that was where uh, it kind of led me. And then I always, it's very important to always keep think time. You have to have the ability to think. And so putting that in the calendar is, is important too. You got to get out there and see. So, you know, micromanaging wasn't necessarily my thing, but there were certain people that needed it, certain people that didn't. Cool. Thank you. Uh huh. Hi, I'm Catherine, and I was just curious what you do for fun and what are some of your hobbies outside of your business career? Well, I, uh, I play tennis badly, but I love to play <laughs> tennis. Um, I, I do like to do um, a little bit of yoga, and then I read. Then I try it when my son was younger, I played with him, and now being 22, he doesn't want to play with me anymore. <laughs> so really tennis, a little bit of you know, yoga, and then uh, we also like to travel. Thank you. Uh -huh. Hi, I'm Reiki, um, and I wanted to know, so, my pers from my perspective, I think, when I think of fashion, I think, you know, New York, LA. I don't necessarily think, you know, Texas. And so where have you kind of been based out of with your 
fashion related positions and do you feel like my perspective of it not really not there not being as many opportunities in Texas is an accurate perspective Depends on what part of the fashion world you want to be in, right? So Neiman Marcus, based out of Texas. Foley's is a department store, was based out of Texas. Uh, now it's all Macy's. Um, I will tell you that most of, if you really want to be design product development, that's probably going to happen more out of New York, LA, San Francisco. Now having said that, when you think about some of these, like Nike, they have a big design studio. It's not in either one of those cities. When you think about Fossil, which was, you know, anybody know Fossil? It's right here in your backyard. You know, they're still here. So there's a lot of, you know, businesses that are actually manufacturing or, or designing. And then you think about the tech world here in Austin. There's a, they need designers and graphic designers and things like that. Not so much in the textile world, though. So it depends on what area that you're, that you're thinking about. Uh, J.C. Penney's based out of, uh, out of Texas, so. Would you say that you predominantly were with your positions based out of New York? Well, interestingly enough, uh, Victoria's Secret's home is Columbus, Ohio. But all the design and all of that and creative is out of New York. So I would probably tell you between my time with Victoria's Secret, I was 50% in New York and 50% in Columbus, Ohio. Hello, Ms. Turney. My name is Jeffrey. Hi, uh, Jeffrey. Thank you for being here today with us. Uh, I know that uh, taking care of people is very important to you. Uh, I'm wondering if uh, in business you've ever had to make any tough decisions that have affected a lot of people. Yes. Um, you know, it's, it's interesting is that you probably, if you haven't hired people and fired people, you probably can't be a vice president. If you, if you don't know how to do that. And let me tell you, it's gut-wrenching. Hiring is easy, except, let me tell you the statistic. When you go hire somebody, if you hire four people, one's going to be great, one's going to be bad, and two are going to be okay. That's the statistic. Now, when I, uh, the, the thing about firing people, it is hard. And, but I will tell you, I finally got comfortable with it. First of all, you have to be fair with the package. The other thing is, is they were struggling so much, they had to be miserable. It's almost like the people that you finally said, go do something else, this isn't for you, have come back and called me back and said, thank you. I have now found something I'm really good at. But it's, it's, a ter it's not easy, I will tell you that. If it were, you'd be kind of heartless. Thank you, Ms. Turney. You bet. Hello, Mr. Um, my name is Jesse Del Rio. Uh, first of all, thank you for be being here tonight. In your initial speech, you talked about the importance of leadership and philanthropy. And uh, you talked about how Victoria's Secret has an employee to employee fund and how Victoria's Secret emailed employees to make sure that they were okay after in a natural disaster. And you encourage us to, to give back and you yourself are giving back right now by, by being here tonight and by uh, empowering women every day. But how do you create the right balance between corporate social responsibility and making a company financially successful? Well, you know, one of the things we said is that when you're doing, you know, when you do well, then you can do good. If you are, if you are financially as your corporation not healthy, then it's going to be very tough for you to start to, to give back. So it's when you get to that point that you can give back. Some people can just give their time because it is time, talent, and treasure. And it is a balance. And the other thing I didn't talk about when I was talking about philanthropy, too, is that we, you will get probably emailed every day about something, giving to this or giving to that. I know I did. I thought, okay, I'm going to give a dollar here. I'm going to give a $10, $200 here, whatever. That's not making the impact. What you really have to do is, again, find what you truly want to go after and go after with a vengeance, therefore putting your, your time and talent and treasures into that will make a bigger difference. So I think, I don't know if I've answered your question, but a, a, corpor a corporation who's not doing well financially can't do good. It's hard for them to give back. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I have a question about time management. Ah. 
<laughs> so approximately how many hours would you think that you work per week and how do you manage your professional work life versus the balance um, or time spent with your family? Yeah, you know, um, time management for, in your, for probably any senior executive, it, it's tough. It's almost like your calendar rules you. And if you don't rule your calendar, it will. So, you know, when, when Matthew was, my son's name is Matthew, when he was in school, I would start out the first year and put all of his activities on the calendar first. And then said everything had to work around that. So I had to, if I had to go to the Far East, I'd say, okay, let's move it a week because he's got this. Sometimes it worked, sometimes it didn't. There are only, when you think there's only 360, what, how many hours? There's 2,040 hours in a year. That's it. You can't, you can create anything but more time. And so then you have to say, what is important? Is this important work or is this just something I might want to do? And you have to take it away. And you have to schedule time for yourself. Because if you get run down and if you get tired and then you're going to a meeting and you've got big decisions and you're grumpy and all these people have worked so hard to get prepared for that meeting, that's not fair. So work-life balance, and, and, and I'm sure you find this in school too, is one of the most important skills you need to get. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hi, my name is Stephanie. So first I wanted to just um, give a little thing of curiosity I've always had about the company and then tie it into a question. Um, so I've always been around Victoria's Secret stores and I've always wondered what if there was a Victor's Secret? Like what if there was a version for men? And so I've always, uh, you talked about empowerment of, of women and confidence. Um, what does a company do for men? Like not just for women, but just for humans in general. Well, you know, it, it's interesting. I probably get a letter a day about opening up Victor. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, we've made a decision about focus. Mm -hmm. And so we said, well, what business do we want to be in? And who, who do, is that customer we want to serve? And so we strategically made the decision to be in the young female business. And so that's what we did. Now, at the same time, we employ many, many men. There are buyers, there's designers. I will tell you the head of the lingerie design at one point in time was a man. So they are, you know, so we, we hire men all the time in all of our stores. They can't really necessarily go into the fitting room, uh, but <laughs> I'm sure that will change too someday. But anyway, they can't go into the fitting room, but we hire men a lot. But we made the strategic decision to be in the young female business. And my dad loves your aftershave, by the way. So. Oh, good. <laughs> oh, good. See, we do have a little something for him. Yeah, there you go. Forgot all about that. Thank you. Hi, my name is Marcela. Um, so you talk about how Victoria's Secret is a company for women, run by women, and how you like want to keep uh, the stores, you know, young. So how do you like transmit that um, the message of women empowerment when the company can sometimes be perceived as idealizing this like body type or you know sexualizing women? Yeah. Not an, not an, uh, I, I appreciate the question. Um, first of all, did anybody hear that question? Um, first of all, is that what many people, sexy to many people, if I can look at something and say it's sexy, you can look at something and say, well, I don't think that's sexy. It, it's really just each human choice, right? And that's the way that we, that's the way that we look at it. And when we think about our supermodels, and what they do, we think about them as women and that they show confidence. And every woman, I don't care what your size, shape, how tall you are, it's like we want you to be confident. And that's what it's about. You need to be happy with what you are and who you are. And because we're all not going to be, you know, we're all not going to have long hair down to our knees, we're not all going to have short hair, we're all going to be different. And it's being confident into that. And I think that's what we're really wanting for women to feel, is that confidence. Yes, we get slammed a lot. Well, how come you don't show you know, models this way or that way? And you know what? It's just another choice about it. So uh, it's not meaning to exclude anyone because we don't. But that's the way that we want to think about our brand. And hopefully, this helps women to gain confidence. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hi. Hi. Um, thank you for coming. My name is Vartika, and I just wanted to ask you, um, do you have any favorite memories or a highlight with working with Victoria's Secret? Oh, my gosh. I have tons. 
tons. Where do I start? Um, what are my fun memories? Well, I guess, you know, everybody was wanting to know about the, the celebs and the, and the models and, and all of that. So I'll share some of my fun memories about that. It's always fun to go to the fashion show. Not because, I mean, I've been to 16. So, but it's not because <laughs> that I'm, you know, it's fun to watch everybody. It's like who I'm sitting next to and just watching the people and how they act. So the guys usually come to the fashion show. They act like they did back when they were 16. I don't understand <laughs> it. And so it's so much fun to watch that. So that's a fond memory. And then depending on who is sitting next to you, um, and I bet you it's true. Um, there are other fond memories. You know, we do, we do one thing every year, which is called the Pelotonia, which is raising money for cancer. And we do it, it's a bike race that we put on. So the first thing we do is that Victoria's Secret will compete against Bath and Body Works, which is already, already part of the L Brands family. And then uh, La Senza, whomever else. And so, then we want, so we always win because we have to win. And we want to raise the most money. And then we go, we bike ride. So I ride 50 miles every year. And it is so much fun because, first of all, none of us have gone out to practice riding 50 <laughs> miles an hour. So then you have all these stops, and, the, and it's the most delicious food because I never eat it. It's peanut butter with grape jelly on white bread is what they give you. <laughs> and so it's a great excuse to eat that. It takes us hours to ride 50 miles. People could probably run faster than we can. So that are some of the fond memories, and I'll give you one more. So one year, it was April Fool's Day, right? So I sent a memo out, excluded all the like, d d you know, directors and above, and just went out to all the people that were below that and said, OK, I want you to get your boss. You have my permission to come in night before, come in early, and get your boss for April Fool's Day. They were so, and we had a contest, and I don't, I don't remember what I gave them. But they had did the greatest things. One guy came to work. They had emptied his entire office and moved him into a cubicle and said, do not enter. So he thought he had been fired. I mean, they came up <laughs> with some of the best things. And those are some very, very fond memories for me. I could go on, on and on and on, <laughs> on and on. Am I getting the? Uh, one, one last question. Oh, sorry. Here. I thought I was getting the hook again. <laughs> Hi, I'm Sarah. Um, you obviously didn't become CEO overnight, so I just wanted to know how you stayed motivated over the years to get where you are now. Because I was learning something new every day. I never once asked to be promoted. Never once. I was learning something every day. And maybe I just didn't have that sense of like, oh my gosh, I'm, I'm the best of this yet. And so, I, probably the fear of failure. Uh, but I was learning something new every day. And I kept, and I think it comes from the passion that just kept me motivated. Uh, you know, I've held, let's see, I've worked for three companies in my life out of 40 years. So, uh, Neiman's for 12 years, and you say, well, why'd you leave Neiman's? Because I got bored. I thought, oh my gosh, it was like 35 stores, I had just launched the website, I couldn't th think about going to another fashion show, so I got bored, and all of a sudden, here's this totally vertical company that I can go into, and that they design their own product, make their own product. So I thought, ah, this is a great new learning experience. And it's been a great ride for 16 years. Thank you. Uh-huh. Thank you all for the great questions. And thank you so much. It was oh, very, very you guys, really it's been such it. a pleasure to be here. Thank you, for that. Kenny, back to you. All right. Thank you very much, Dean Platt and Ms. Turney. Uh, we appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedules to come speak with our students. I know that we'll be able to take your lessons about uh, how philanthropy is our capacity as humans to give and how to be truly happy with who we are and what we are and how you know, some Sooners are pretty all right and uh, be able to apply them into our own lives. Now, we do have a tradition here at VIP and as a token of our appreciation, the Undergraduate Business Council would like to present Ms. Turney with this personalized Stenson cowboy hat in recognition oh. of your participation in the VIP Distinguished Speaker Series. Oh, wow, it's a black hat, too. There we go. This is great. Let me make sure I put this on my... Now, can you give me a hook em? I can give you if I have to. <laughs> thank you so, much. so, thank you.